Uh, as we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, we're going to read verses 10 through 14 together out loud. 2 Corinthians 13, verses 10 through 14. So if you've got your Bible there, uh, welcome to being with us. First time reading from the King James, if that helps, um, on your Bible app or whatever. So uh, we encourage often that we read together out loud. It helps us to worship the Lord and be a part of the service. So if you would, begin reading in verse 10 with me to the end of the chapter. Therefore, I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. When we come to the end of this passage, I, I say it's the last message because I'm not 100% convinced even at the beginning of this message that the very last verse won't be a message unto itself as we come to the close. We'll see how, if we're, if it's still two o'clock, I'll, we'll see. Uh, it's a joke, visitors, not by much, but it's a joke. Okay, so 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, we come into this and I have titled this just simply Final Admonitions. I'm not sure that that's even a great title, but these are coming down to the final thoughts, as it were, of this passage. Uh, we've walked through in 2 Corinthians here these uh, last several weeks over these passages about growth, and they're going to be a part of the message today as well because it comes up again. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, when you look at uh, verse 9, for we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong, and this also we wish, this is what we're praying for, even your perfection. Uh, something that I've been walking through in Sunday school for the last three weeks as well is sanctification, the idea of being set apart unto God. And this is something that we should know, that God is purposely working in your life to grow you. Now, I think very often Christians struggle with their growth. They wonder, am I really growing? Uh, I feel stagnant. I don't really feel like uh, I'm, I'm where I need to be or I don't feel like maybe where I was. Um, let's just take a time out here. And, and I do know uh, that very often we pray things as if um, we want God to do all of what's supposed to happen and, and, and kind of not have any responsibility for what we need to do ourselves. But they live together. They live together. The idea that we have some choices and decisions that we need to make, but I think you should know that God is actively at work in your life. Now, He's at work in your life in, in one of two ways in this morning service, brother. By the way, that's what I was going to say. Brother Bert uh, Durham prayed for the offering this morning. I called him Burnt Durham uh, because he lives up in the Ola area and that whole place has been on fire. That was my little joke, burnt Durham. Okay, so anyway, uh, but glad you guys are here. They don't even smell like smoke. Um, when, you, when you go away from your house, let me ask you this way, first of all. How many of you garden? Anybody garden? Or uh, you, you at least take a stab at it, okay? You, you plant something. Uh, do you know what it's like to go away in August for a week? and come back to your garden, right? What happens? What happens? Uh, now, how many of you grow tomatoes? Okay. I, I think tomatoes are a good example of this. We were, we were gone this past week. We weren't gone the whole week. We were gone, I think, four days and came back and we found, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a, a volunteer, people call this a weed, but it's a volunteer tomato plant. So that's not a weed, okay? Uh, but we were surprised at how quickly that thing grew just in the short time that we were gone. Now, the, the, I think the vegetable that does this better than any other plant has to be the cucumber. Because if you're not, if you're not careful to check, 
In one week's time, you can come back and you can find instead of a cucumber, a torpedo. <laughs> Are you with me, right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. I mean, we're talking about cucumbers like this long. Yeah, and by the way, we're getting close to that time of year, everybody. We're at church. You probably should start locking your doors because <laughs> you're going to start finding cucumbers <laughs> and tomatoes and things in your car, all right? So, uh, well, what happens is that those plants naturally grow as a result of God, as a result of what God is doing in the world. Uh, <clears throat> there's a reason, there's a harvest, there's a reason that plants grow, there's a reason that farmers can expect a harvest. Now, yes, they've got to do some things, right? But God makes those things to grow because it's his design. Now, the reason I bring this up is I want you to know, and I think it's important to know, that Christians can often have this huge, continually guilty feel about their life, about their growth. Um, you know, maybe it's the short man syndrome. It's where you stop growing and you put yourself up against the wall sometime as a teenager and you wonder, are you going to get at least one more inch of growth? Uh, or some young lady who wanted to be taller or whatever. Uh, and you wonder, am I, am I actually growing? Well, I think you need to know that God is for you in your growth. And he's working two ways. Either one, he is working at your life, in your life, to draw you, as Bert prayed, to draw you to know Christ as Savior, to come to be his child, or he's working in your life as his child to fashion you to grow, to look and be more like a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ. Now, this is the natural outworking of what he's doing in your life. He is actively at work to do exactly that. And it is the natural course of his work in your life. Now, when I ask, does he do it all? Well, what I really mean to say is, does he do it apart from your choices? No. He works in coordination with your life, your will, your choices to surrender to that growth, but it's yours to do. And in that, I think it's healthy for you to know that God is working in your life in that fashion and for that purpose, and he's for you so that you would grow in your fellowship with him. And it's why in verse 10, you have the therefore, therefore. The therefore is there as a building upon verse 9 in particular. And again, I'll read verse 9 again. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we wish, and the idea of wishes to pray for, this is what we're praying for, even your perfection. That perfection is going to come up again in today's message, but it is there uh, with the idea that you would be maturing in your walk with the Lord. So the first thing we're going to do when walking through verse 10 is identify that there's a purpose. Uh, the, Therefore, I write these things. Why is Paul taking it upon himself to write out and to be uh, purposeful about writing out what he's written to the Corinthians. Well, I think there's a few things to know. First of all, dealing with things or dealing with issues before they deal with you is often an admonition that people will have. There are things that you have to take care of, or we often say in, a, in, in maybe a darker sense, they'll take care of you. So you have some things that you need to be watchful for, things that you need to be mindful of. And he says, I need to deal with some things in the Corinthian lives because they need to be dealt with. So it's built upon this idea of their growth, their maturity, and their welfare. Uh, and yet, have you ever had times where you had to say things to people that were hard to say? Things that needed to be said, but aren't easy to say. And just a few little thoughts here. Ignoring a problem won't make it go away right? I, th I find it interesting. So in the analogy of the illustrations of the plants, um, hired one of our young people to do things on this side of the building uh, that we really don't have anybody else doing. They were landscaping kinds of things. And at the beginning of the summer, they went on this side of the building, and, and that's about what they had time for, to clean up to trim and to take care of things that had been missed in our landscaping. 
And to me, it's very identifiable uh, what was done over there when you drive over there. So I'll give you, for instance, the first thing that I saw when I drove up uh, was there's a tree on the northeast side of this parking lot that has uh, suckers growing up from the bottom. You know what I'm talking about? So, okay. Now, they started, and I knew they needed to be done at the beginning of the summer. They started about like that. Now, those suckers have grown up to be almost level with the lowest branches of that tree. And it's surrounding the tree, right? So, either you take care of something or it has its head and will become an issue that just gets magnified. And this is hard to do sometimes. It's hard to be confrontational. It's hard to say hard things. And very often I think pastors uh, are remiss in not saying the hard things because they want everything to be love and everybody to, frankly, to like them and say they did a good job. But truthfully, truthfully, the things that pastors need to worry about is presenting the truth of God's Word. And I've got to tell you, there are times when I preach, I wonder if anybody's going to come back. <laughs> right? When you preach messages that are uh, convicting or messages that make us examine our walk with God in a world that is more and more moving away from a tolerance of hearing the Word of God, uh, I'm, I feel it's a blessing that anybody comes. But saying the truth, and as Paul said earlier, they could do nothing against the truth but for the truth, that's where we all need to stand. And Paul is doing this the confrontation, because it was necessary. But I also want to say this confrontation does not have to be done negatively. And I think that's the spirit of what he's saying here. As an apostle, the Lord had given him power. And he said it was not a power that he wanted to use to hurt, but rather to build. Verse 10, therefore I write these things. I write these things because I want you to grow. I write these things because I want you to mature in your walk with God. I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord has given me to edification and not to destruction. And here's the idea. It's a phrase that I've used here a lot and a phrase that I want to continually make a part of my life, and that is, our desire is to be a builder and not a breaker. Now, how well do you use your tongue? Is your tongue a builder or a breaker? Is your communication a builder or a breaker? And the truth is, we have moments of both. We have moments, you ever had those words escape your mouth that you really wish had not? Have you ever had that tone behind your conversation that you thought better of immediately after saying it? Well, Paul is saying that there are right things that need to be said. And there are right things that need to be said to God's people, especially when there's a doctrine that's being missed or an application of doctrine that's being taken, uh, applied wrongly that needs to be said so that people can be brought, brought to growth. Now, uh, I, I said it this morning as a result of the study of sanctification, and I know I talk about Joe just about every Sunday, but you know, we're working in his life to help that little guy grow. The illustration I used in Sunday school was... We, we, believe it or not, we, we try to help that boy know how to dress. Uh, we, we try to help him uh, know what it looks like to, to be presentable. But the truth of the matter is a seven-year-old does not care. <laughs> does not care a whit. Uh, he could not care in the least that he has a button-up shirt on today with a collar. He could care in the least, that he's, that he's got a tie on. Matter of fact, he'd be just as pleased as punch not to have it. Now, I, I said this this morning in Sunday school, and I, I think I have to correct it. I, I said that, you know, I'm not sure that he even cares that he has clothes on. Um, I think he's actually reached the point that he probably does care about that, but not much. Not much. He cares, but not much. But you expect a young person to grow but they have to be taught. And, and sometimes those are easy lessons. Hey, you know, we don't do that. Why don't we do that? Well, we give reasons and hopefully good reasons. 
Um, or we do do this. And why do we do that? Well, you hopefully give the good reasons, but you're helping somebody to grow. And, and here's what I'm saying in Christianity. We really should be evaluating our growth and why we do what we do under the banner of our walk with God. But what I do know is that God is actively working in everybody's life in this room to either draw you to faith in Christ, where you'll know Him personally as your Redeemer, or to grow you as a believer in your walk with Christ. And, and let's be fair, ready? Every one of us has some growing to do. Fair? Now, if you don't own that, you still have some growing to do, and it probably has to be anchored around self-righteousness and pride. There's not a one of us that is unburdened with the carnality of our flesh. It's present every day, and sometimes it doesn't take much to bring it out. But we purposely put on Jesus Christ as a matter of growth. Now, I'm going to say something about this that's not really in the message, but you're used to that. And I've heard some people say, well, I, you know, I'm not going to be fake. I'm not going to pretend something there is, is that, that it isn't. And, and let me put it to you this way. It's like smiling at church. Do you always, first of all, some of you say smiling at church. I don't feel obligated. Okay. Um, others of you, purposely will put on a smile when you come to church. Fair enough? But do you always feel like smiling? No. Is it fake to put it on? Well, I would argue that it's not, and here's why. We purposely put on Jesus Christ. It is the right thing to purposely want to see Him. But it's a matter of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life to grow you to look like him. So, he says, I want to use the power that I have to be a builder and not a breaker in your life. And I do think that we need to remember this whenever confrontation has to be had. It doesn't have to be with furrowed brow. It doesn't have to be with veins bulging. It doesn't have to be with angry spirit to say something that needs to be said. It can be said in a loving manner, and I would say that it's only through yielding to the Lord that you'll actually have the power to do that. But then we come into the last part of these verses, verse 11. Finally, my brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. The God of love and peace shall be with you. Now, as it goes on, I'm going to stop there in verse 11. Verse 11 really could just be the entirety of the message because this is a, a list of the bees. Be these things. But before the bees are these thoughts, or it was this thought, and it is the farewell. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because, honestly, the farewell, is it just the closing of the letter? Or is it Paul's intimation that he's going to depart from them uh, and no longer be with them, no longer be uh, even on the planet as the Lord takes him home? Is that, is that what's in mind? But what we know is this, that when you come to these finallys, the finally is the sum up, know this. If you're going to remember something, remember these things. And so here in this list of the finallys are, is a list of things that are good for each of us to consider in our growth in the Lord. So in the farewell, we go through, first of all, this idea that he's already given once before, and that is be perfect. Take your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Be perfect. Be perfect. So I have to tell you that our family is in the mad dash. Um... We've got this week, next Sunday, we leave to go to Montana. We leave after the morning service. We're going to go take all of our family to go see Abby and Dakota in Lodgegrass, Montana. It's from Lodgegrass that we'll spend a few days with Abby and Dakota, and then Bethany and Heather will be on an airplane to fly to Wisconsin, where they're both going to go to school together at Maranatha Baptist University. So... This week is like a ton of preparation, right? So, 
uh, suitcases being packed already. And by the way, Bethany is sick while all this stuff is supposed to be happening. That's why she's not here. So her preparation is just being in bed, okay? Um, but there's all these things that need to get done. So I, I'm remembering all these things I need to teach them. So uh, I, get on, I get on the computer yesterday and Bethany's in bed, Heather's in the room, and I said, I'm gonna cast this on the screen. I'm gonna show you guys how to write checks using your bank account online so you don't have to write a paper check because you guys don't have paper checks. I need to show you how to do this stuff. Oh yeah, and then I need to show you how to do this. I need to show you how to do that. And you know what? I'm not gonna get it all done. But the idea of perfection is to be instructed so that a person is fully equipped to carry out the tasks that are in front of them. They have all the information that they need. And they are able to use that information and make correct and discernible right choices that honor God in the process. This is what wisdom is. Wisdom is the acquisition of knowledge so that it is understood and then applied under the banner of fearing and honoring God. That's what wisdom is. It's a lifelong pursuit, but it's what we've trained our young people for. And what I find is that, as I said last week, there's never enough time, but in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, you have these admonitions about our growth, our maturity. It's what God has called you to do. So verses 8 through 10 of 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter 5, would you read out loud with me at verse 8 through 10? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. This is what God is doing in the believer's life. Look again at verse 10. But the God of all what? I think this is going to come up again. But the God of all grace, who's called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus, who's he talking to? Believers who have the hope of what? heaven, because of salvation, because of faith in Christ, because of what God has promised. All believers who have that hope, he says, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Is it life, the longer you live, doesn't it often feel like tossed salad? Aren't there those moments that you had a plan to go this way, and God said, no, this way. You had a plan that it was going to be like this, and God said, no, it's going to be like this. And I think what happens is that our carnality is always present in that process. And our carnal man will still do, even as a believer, what sometimes or often was done as an unbeliever. And that is when something doesn't go the way that we want, our mind immediately begins to question the goodness of God. God must not love me because he did not give me what I wanted. Or God must have forsaken me because I didn't, this did not lay out the way that I thought it was going to lay out. I want to say that that's just bad doctrine. I want you to remember that God is, as it says right here, but the God of all, what? It's in verse 10, 1 Peter 5, verse 10, but the God of all. Grace. Now, a way of saying that, by the way, grace applied in the New Testament is very often the idea of the gospel. But in a broader sense, it is the gifts of God's goodness manifested in many ways, most particularly in the gospel. What this means is, is that God is a good God bestowing upon us that which we do not deserve because he's a good God. But sometimes life has that curveball. And it's not what I wanted, not what I expected. And I want to challenge you to squash the thought when it arises that when you don't get what you want or when it's somehow deviated from what you thought the plan was, 
I want you to squash the idea that somehow God doesn't love you or God is somehow mean or God does not care about you because that is not the nature of how God describes himself in his word. He is a God of grace. He's called us to glory by Christ Jesus, which means he's invited us to come to know him and be his children. But he says, after you have suffered a while, now you are going to suffer in this world. Wake up call. Right? It's going to happen. Life is going to be difficult at certain spots, but it doesn't mean that God has lost his goodness. I think we should remember again that this world is not our home. This is not where all our hope sits. Now, I want to make sure that as I say this, that you know that while I have the hope of heaven in front of me, I have the joy of God present with me. And you do as well. God wants you to know his grace. And he says, after you have suffered a while, it's his goal in your life to make you mature, to make you established, to strengthen, and here it is, folks, to settle you. Now, you're not going to want to raise your hand on this at all, okay? How easily are you provoked? There's another way of asking it. How easily are you angered? Do you get angry? And how much does it take to get you there? I want you to think about it. Now, let me ask you, should that be a part of the character of your life as a believer? I'm going to say it this way, carnal anger and the expression of it, should it be a part of your life? We, nobody, not everybody wanted to answer that. Should it be a part of your life? No. But then, no, no, wait a second. It's more complicated than that because sometimes I have a right to be angry. You don't know what he did. If you only knew what he did, you'd be angry too. Here, here's what my thought is. You know, on the scale of zero to 10, 10 being the worst exhibition of anger, wherever you consider yourself in that scale, our anger needs to be dealt with. We need to grow up. We need to mature. And look like Jesus when trouble comes. So what I am telling my two college girls is that you're going to be put in a whole lot of pressure. There's going to be a lot of pressure coming to your life from all sides. And you're going to have too much to do and you're going to think there's no way I can get it all done. And that may be actually so. but look like Jesus when pressure comes. Running around in a tizzy with the sky is falling is wasted energy. God is trustworthy. And when you know that God is trustworthy, that knowledge will strengthen and that knowledge will settle you. So, it's a thing. Um, there are several people in this building this morning that have raised kids. Those kids have now left the house. And when kids leave the house, what happens with the house? Well, all of a sudden, it's It's clean. <laughs> It's clean and it's something else. It's clean and it's... Ah, did you hear that? Like, man, I didn't take any prompting whatsoever. It's clean, it's quiet. You get used to that quietness. I think you get used to it. But it's funny to me to watch sometimes grandparents get around like that. You hear that out there? <laughs> There's a charismatic kid out there. You recognize that scream? 
Sometimes when kids are being rambunctious, you will hear this admonition from parents or grandparents or any adult that wants to volunteer. Settle down. Now, that's a pretty stark thing to say to someone when everything seems like it's going crazy in your life. Uh, What I do want to say, though, for your growth, settle down in your confidence in God. Just settle down. For those who know Jesus, here's what you know. It's going to be okay. Ultimately, the believer is bound to be with Christ forever. The world may do its worst and there will be pain and there can be sorrow and there can be suffering, but do its worst, it can't break your relationship to Jesus. Once you're his child, he sees you as good, as glorified and in heaven, Romans 8. So settle down. And yet, many of us still, when trouble comes, We go to the world of tizzy and frantic and and immaturity of, this isn't what I want, and we get upset. And and I've, I've noticed it in me. We can excuse it for all kinds of things. I'm tired. I have pain. I have whatever. But all that stuff does is draw you to the need of Jesus. And here's the good thing about the Lord. He is always, always ready for you to come to him. Amen? So what do you need to come to him about this morning? What is it that's going on in your life that throws that anger, or throws that volatility, that throws that carnal nature present in front of you and you've accepted it, you've tolerated it, and you've stayed in that childlike fashion? This morning, I'm just encouraging you to settle down in the Lord. Be perfect. As you can tell... If I take this long on every one of these, this will be another month yet. So, the next one is to be of good comfort. Be of good comfort. Take your Bibles to John 14. John 14. So, what I want you to know is that He will not leave you comfortless. Now, what's that mean? Everybody with me? You got really young people in here. You got young marrieds. You got old marrieds. Really old marrieds. Some widows. I'm really refraining about marriage right now, saying everything I want to say, but... What you're going to find is that God knows that you're an emotional person. Some of you, some of you are pretty tough, right? I'm going to use an illustration right here. I I probably shouldn't uh, because I don't have permission to do so. I'm going to use it anyway. Mary Grace. Mary Grace uh, had had a mishap on a motorcycle this week and slid over and scraped her knee pretty, pretty solidly. And I didn't see it. I just saw the aftermath of her walking away from it. I want to tell you, now, I, I, now I, she may have at some other time, but from the time that she walked away from that motorcycle, not one time did I see her even come close to shedding a tear. And I'm like, girl, I'd be crying all over the place. <laughs> Some of you are pretty tough. You know, something pretty tough. You can handle a lot of things. But, but here's the thing. You may not be showing it, but all of us know what it's like to have our emotions all over the place and struggle. Now, I, I got a question for you. Do, do you ever find yourselves out of sorts and you don't even know why? Most people call that grumpy. Okay. And nobody ever likes to be asked the question, why are you grumpy? <laughs> nobody really likes to ever be asked that. And sometimes we're so personally offended, we, 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 
Why do you think I'm grumpy? <laughs> the truth is, this is your life emotionally. This is where you are. Now, I'm asking, isn't that true? That you're here and you're here and you're here and you're here and, and you're, and you may not show it, but you have all these things going on in you. But here's what God knows. You are going to need his comfort. You're going to need it. Because he knows this frame that you're in and what you're struggling with and how hard life can be. He knows that about you. And he's identified in this passage of 2 Corinthians, this, this prayer for the Corinthian believers that they would be perfect and that they would be of good comfort. And that is that they would be comforted. Now, it's, it's maybe just a sentimental way of saying it, but comfort to me is expressed in the warm embrace of God. It's a warm embrace of God. It's sometimes God holding you without words through whatever emotional thing you're going through. In John chapter 14, verse 16, read verses 16 through 18 out loud with me. John 14, 16 through 18, read with me now. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you, and I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. So by nature of the doctrine of the word, what does God do to meet your need of comfort? He gives you his person through the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, who can be with you at all times, everywhere you go at every moment, knowing you better than you know yourself. So, another way of asking this question, have you ever had somebody ask you what's wrong? Yes? And you didn't have in mind what it was, but you knew in your own heart and life something was. Well, the God of comfort knows that too. The God of all comfort knows whatever it is that's triggering your emotional dismay. And God does not do that. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm not the best comforter. You're surprised. I'm not the best comforter. When I see someone in pain, I look immediately for causality. And if I can identify causality, I can help. But if I can't identify causality, meh, what do I do with that? I don't know what to do with that. Very often I think it, look, it, it takes uh, the form of looking like God and instead of trying to fix the problem, just hugging the person and trying to comfort them. But God knows those things in your life when you don't. And God knows what's going in inside you, what makes you tick. But God has not come into your life to leave you as you were. When you're redeemed, he's come into your life to change all things and to grow you, to give you stability in Christ, to give you that settled feel of a relationship in him so that you actually feel the comfort of God in your life. Now, his promise is that he will not leave us comfortless. And this morning, I want to encourage you if there's something that you're struggling with that is making you out of sorts, at this moment, you maybe don't need to hear the rest of the message. You just need to bow your head and talk to the Lord right now 
where you are about what it is. You don't maybe need to hear one more word of this message, but I want you to know that the God of comfort is very present at hand with you. Now, that's true for where you are, but everybody needs to know this. He's not only there for what is present today, but that's going to be you. You know, Daniel, how old are you? 16. You've seen some trouble in your life. You've got siblings. Um, <laughs> now, you remember what it was like to be 16? Now, this will surprise you, Daniel. If you could go back to being 16, would you? You hear that? <laughs> here's, here's the thing. You're 16. You want to be out of it. This age usually wants to grow up and be out of it. And then once you get out of it, there's a stage where you want to go back. And then you're just too tired. and You're like, no, I don't want to go through that again. But here's what you know. Whatever stage of life we're at, there are things in front of us that we cannot foresee. But you do know that there is trouble in front of you. So I'm encouraging you to do a Daniel kind of thing right now. Make a decision in your life on how you're going to respond to trouble when it comes. And here's the simple question. You ready? Are you going to look like Jesus or not? The truth is, for many of us, when trouble comes, what people see is us. And it's never good. That's all the stuff that you wish you wouldn't have said. It's the things you wish you wouldn't have done. It's the ways you wish you wouldn't have acted if you would have just been mature in Jesus. Now, before we move on from this, I don't want you to live in the regret of what happened yesterday I want you to live in the surrender of the growth that can happen today. And God can comfort you where you are right now, and you're going to need it. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Believe it or not, we're still in this one verse. <clears throat> be of good comfort. And then he says this, be of one mind. So I'm not, going to end the, I'm not even going to end all of this verse. I'm going to end here this morning for the sake of our time, and I think it's a lot to chew on. We're going to focus on this last one this morning. Be of one mind. Take your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Then we'll look at 1 Peter chapter 3, and this will be our last for this morning. Be of one mind. This is the will of God for his church. You ready? I know you're turning your Bibles. I'll give you a second turn there. I'm going to give you the will of God for this church. I'll know you're there when I see your eyeballs. Okay. The will of God for his church is that his church be unified together. And all God's people said, Amen. this is his desire for his church. And unity would be so easy if it weren't for people. True? It's not really true because I found that people that are by themselves can be just as grumpy as two people together. One person by himself or herself can be as out of sorts as if there was somebody else in the room. But I do want to say this as we wrap up the message this morning. God, are you with me? God wants his children. And it's going to come up in, in the later or the latter parts of this, even this passage. This is something that's born out of loving God and loving each other. But God wants his children to dwell in unity. There's a passage in Romans. I didn't write it down. It's just coming from memory. I, I often, often think of this when I'm talking about unity or talking about peace, it says, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. It's, I think it's in Romans. The uh, first time I saw that was on a dorm room door in college. 
where you have five other roommates, at least I did at Maranatha. My, my freshman, my, excuse me, my sophomore year, I was a prayer captain for my, um, for my dorm room. They gave me five freshmen and me. As if, A, I was mature enough to handle that, and B, that five freshmen would be mature together. And we weren't. <laughs> But I do know this, that God wants his children to dwell in unity, to be of one mind. Now, time out. The context of this passage, we're going to argue, is holistic to the church. And I think that that is the most appropriate application and understanding of the context to which Paul is giving this letter. Because there were false teachers, there were disgruntled people, There were power seekers. There were positional people in the church. There were vying for their spot in the light. See me. Look at me. And Paul's admonition to the church is be unified. But before we go to the church, I want to admonish and exhort the body of Christ to be in unity at home. And that's where it starts. To be unified at home. To be at peace with one another in the house. And to not allow the spirit of disunity to live. And what I'm saying is that right now in this service, there probably should be some repentance and some apology to the Lord and some forsaking of sin, of rebellion over the willful allowing of disunity within your life. And tolerating it as if it's okay. God wants his children to be of one mind. Philippians 2, verse 2. Everybody reading this one verse out loud together. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 2. Let's read this verse out loud together. Ready? Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And all God's people said? Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, I've got to tell you, I don't think I've been 100% successful at this, but I am not a fan of husband-wife jokes where one is tearing the other one down. I'm not a fan. If you knew my husband, roll of the eyes. If you knew my wife, roll of the eyes, how hard she is. I'm not a fan. And now, I, I'm not, not been 100% successful with that because, frankly, a lot of humor is revolving around that door. But I will tell you, there have been times where I've had that kind of humor escape my mouth. And I, just telling you how I feel about it, I have felt the rebuke of the Holy Spirit. That's how, that's how I have felt. It's not really something to play with. We should be unified within our house. And young people, you're going to get challenged in this. There's going to come times in your life where your parents are going to expect things from you that you don't like. Or you're going to have things that you disagree with. And sometimes you can just tolerate it with the idea, well, I disagree and I don't like it. And you can have a rebellious spirit. Well, the Bible says to honor your parents. That means to hold them in high value. It means to esteem them. This is a relationship of a husband and wife, one to the other as well. To honor each other. To value each other. But very often, we tolerate this spirit of disunity for whatever reason we want to put behind the equation. And sometimes, I do think it's like this, there is a carnal joy. It's not lasting, and it's damaging, but there's a carnal joy that comes from living in bitterness. But it never, you've heard the phrase, it never makes you better. 
It sours the life. So unity and one-mindedness is something that you have to strive for. And when you find that it raises its head, it's actually at that moment that you have to say and do sometimes the hard thing, often to yourself, to submit to the Lord, to honor God, and to look like Jesus in those moments. But it takes maturity to do so. It takes experience to do so because you've been there before. And what I'm saying is that too often in Christianity, we've tolerated our carnality and our childishness and have not rebuked or repented that attitude and come to Christ to exhibit maturity and comfort and one-mindedness. Last passage, 1 Peter 3.8. 1 Peter 3.8. Everybody out loud together, and I'll give you a second, 1 Peter 3, 8. Okay, if you're with me, 1 Peter 3, 8, let's read it together. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. And all God's people said, well, wouldn't that look like a healthy church? Yeah, you with me? Wouldn't that look like a healthy church? Well, it takes maturity. It takes growing. And it's something that we all need. Now, let's just talk about this for a second and how it lives. So, perfection here is the idea of growth. Is it that you will never mess up again? Well, I think as long as we're in this human frame, we're going to have somewhat of a Romans chapter 7 experience. The things which I would, I don't. The things that I don't, those that don't want to do, those are the things I do. You're going, to, you're going to have that weight. But as you have that weight, your growth is going to be continually, day after day, if you're going to be surrendered to the Lord, day after day, moment by moment, experience by experience, practicing the walk, your walk with God and surrender to Him. What I'm saying is that the more you practice that walk with God, the more you make the decisions on the front side of how you're going to behave when trouble comes, the more prepared you are to be yielded to the Lord when that moment arrives. And the spirit behind all of this is that you and I, if we're going to grow and be what God wants us to be, we're going to have to be surrendered to this maturing process, and all of us need it. And so, if you have had anger as a part of your life, or if you've had emotional instabilities or um, things that just make you uh, bitter or out of sorts, if those have been a part of your life, let's just say that yesterday you did well. Praise God for doing well yesterday. But you're going to need him every bit as much today. And one day at a time, putting one foot in faith before the next foot in faith, we make decisions to walk with our Lord who is for us and our growth. So he's doing a work in your life. Are you surrendered to that work?